The goal of this presentation is to give some basic introduction to websites online. Now to do so, I'm going to start talking about the internet in general and then kind of narrow it down to more specifics for what business people need to know about the internet. So the internet first came around in 1969 as a Department of Defense experiment to try and figure out a new way to design networks. Trying to get away from the idea of a single central switchboard that would enable to control the entire network. So if you look at the diagram in the middle here, you'll see that the first version of the internet doesn't have somebody in the, just in the center. UCLA, the node on the bottom, can go vertical or horizontal in order to get to UCSB. So theoretically, any one link could be lost and a network would still be able to operate. Roughly 10 years later, this is what the internet looked like. If you look closely at the diagram, you can see some of the names of the different uh, sites on there. For example, on the bottom you can see Texas, on the top Illinois and Utah. And the idea again is that if Illinois has something go bad with their system, that the network will basically route around the damage. Now today, the internet looks a lot more complicated. This is a picture of it a few years ago. The internet is basically a collection of networks together. There's no one center node that controls who can have access to anything. Instead, it basically is made up of high-level peers. In other words, a uh, level one peer is a company that carries a significant amount of traffic and connects with other level one peers. So for you to connect your network, you just need to find someone else that is willing to let you connect through them. So once you get on the internet, the question is, how do we find each other? You'll have probably seen these things called the MAC address. But basically, it's a, it's a marker for the physical hardware in your computer that's called the network card. But the internet, when it gets past sort of the small local network, it uses something called an IP address. And you'll see that here in the number 172.16.254.1. It's a scheme that allows you to go anywhere on the internet. Now the problem we have is we're actually running out of addresses here. So you'll see more complicated versions of this called IPv6, which has a lot more capacity. But for now, an IP address is still the standard way that you connect to another computer on the internet. Now obviously, going to a site and saying 172.16.254.1 is not very user friendly. So we have another way we use to actually sort of remember these numbers. This is called the domain name. The domain names are how IP addresses gets translated into actual words. So the DNS, or domain name system, keeps track of which address goes with what, with what word. So you might have a DNS provider, such as one like .com, that is used to sort of organize different sub-networks. So you might go and buy a .com domain from one of the people that are in charge of managing it. And then they keep track of what words go with what owners and then what IP addresses to route them to. The key idea is that domain names are actually independent of IP addresses. This means that you can buy your domain from one company and be able to host your, domain, your website at another company. Now how do you purchase a name? There's a number of big providers out there like DreamHost or Network Solutions, Yahoo, and GoDaddy. And they all have different pros and cons. You kind of get what you pay for in terms of domain names. Sometimes the cheaper providers actually aren't the best. So I've had a lot of luck with a company called DreamHost, but there's also ones like Network Solutions or Yahoo as well. Generally, I don't recommend GoDaddy, but they are a provider as well. You can find a unique domain, but it can be kind of difficult to get one that's actually good. I have two websites listed here that have different um, basically algorithms that will help you come up with a different name. So you give it a bunch of words and they'll try and find some combination of those words or synonym of those words that's actually available. When you create a website though, it's very important to make sure that it fits certain key criteria. First off, it should be easy to say, spell, and be unambiguous. For example, you can see on the screen here, one website looks like whore presence, but it's actually supposed to be who represents. A similar site that was available in the past that was a big deal for technical sites uh, was called Experts Exchange. But if you read it the wrong way, it would look like Expert Sex Change. Now, there's currently some new top level domains. So instead of just .com or .gov, you have things like .ly or .guru or .nerd, and there's a lot of other options there. These are interesting, and I think long term will have a really positive effect on making more names available. 
However, in the short term for businesses, I kind of recommend against them just because they are so new. Sometimes people will have a tendency to automatically try and add .com after them. When you think about the internet, people usually are just thinking about websites. However, there's a lot of other things happening on the internet as well. You have things like email, FTP, news groups, telnet, other sort of resources. Nowadays though, the most common is actually video. So video is the most common thing on the internet. There's also things like peer-to-peer, -peer, like BitTorrent, and also website as well. The top left chart shows the distribution over time, and the bottom right chart shows the overall growth and sort of rescaled. So basically all these things are going up, just the amount of traffic we have just increasing dramatically. Now the actual thing we think of when we talk about the internet, the things we go through Chrome or Internet Explorer, is actually called the World Wide Web. Basically it's a system that sits on top of the internet. And it's a way of sharing information easily and making links between things. It was started by a man named Tim Berners-Lee. Now he's actually been knighted, so it's Sir Tim Berners-Lee. But the basic key is that it's distributed. The idea is that no one computer or system controls the whole thing, and it's up to each person and their website to keep track of what's happening. Now you often see two different kinds of prefixes with it. You see HTTP and HTTPS. The S just stands for secure, and it means that the traffic you send back and forth is encrypted. This is important when things like banking, when you're in a coffee shop in Starbucks. If you use an unencrypted connection, anyone who's on the same network can generally see the traffic you're sending back and forth based upon how that network is set up. The WWW is a bit of a historical accident. It came about because when the internet was first being developed, web, World Wide Web or websites were not the most important site. You might have had the main site of an organization actually be Gopher or FTP or some other service. And so the WWW was a way of sort of separating off the, the internet from the rest of the World Wide Web. Nowadays, the primary way we access stuff is through the World Wide Web, and so those WWWs are basically redundant. Now you look at websites, and you can find a pretty interesting growth pattern. Now this is something that we see a lot with IT stuff. So originally it started out in 85, and you see it really took a long time before the World Wide Web really began to take off. You see it sort of spiraling up in 99 and 2000, crashing a bit in 2001, and then spiking up again. And this is a kind of a common growth curve with IT stuff. Often when the public hears about it, it's been out there for another 10 years before that point. But it takes a while to get the technology to the point where it can really be adopted by a mass audience. So how then do you actually set up a business website? The major pieces is first to buy a domain name, then to set up a website, and then third to analyze and optimize. And hopefully you can make a profit. So how do you host the website? There's a bunch of free options like Google Sites, Blogger, or WordPress that offer basic utilities to anyone. So these are things where they have the software already pre-built and you're limited to what they can offer you. They generally make money by offering upsell options. For example, WordPress will let you have a free blog or you can pay the money to have one with a better domain name. You can also pay monthly hosting. This could be on a shared or virtual or dedicated computer. There's some examples here that you might be able to look at. The basic idea is with the shared server, your website sits on a computer along with a bunch of other websites. The downside here is that if one of the other websites becomes really busy, your website becomes slower. So it's hard to make a website consistently perform well on a shared server. If you need your website to be consistently fast, you want something like a dedicated or a virtual server where you're guaranteed a certain level of performance because no one else is using or sharing your resources. You can also set up a local server on your own site and host a website just from your own company. That's generally a bad idea. Most organizations don't have the resources to do as good of a job as one of the hosted companies can do. Similarly for email, a lot of companies will use Exchange as their back-end email server, but in general it's much better to host that kind of thing externally and pay a monthly fee as opposed to trying to deal with the complexity of mail on your own. Now how does a website actually get retrieved online? This is typically the way we look at it. You have a client such as on a laptop. They issue a command that's called a GET. That goes to the internet. We typically show the internet as a cloud on this kind of diagram because we don't really know what happens inside of there. You just send a message in and get a message out. On the other side, you have a server that gets that request. For this example, it's just a simple little web page. So it returns it to the internet and gets it given back to the client. 
However, most, time, most of the time, it's actually more complicated than this to host a website. That example was with what's called a static page. It's pretty rare to find that on most websites nowadays because it's the same for every single user and most websites want customization. To get a dynamic page, you have to have a database backend with a content management system, and this is much more common. Let me show you how this works. So I'm breaking down that first diagram to give you a little bit more detail. So we have the end client laptop computer issuing the request, and that goes through the internet to a server. On the server, there's a software called web server software, which could be something like Apache or IIS on Microsoft platform. That software then looks at the request, goes to the hard drive, finds the file, and then returns it to the end user. And that's the basic process. For a dynamic page, however, this is a little bit more complicated. For a dynamic page, you have something that's called a programming language on the back end. So it starts out the same way, but the key thing is that once it gets to the hard drive, the page that it has here is not just returned to the client. Instead, it's actually run through a software. Typically, a common one you'll run into is called PHP. PHP takes the code and actually runs it and generates the result. So you see here, the first one looks a little bit different than the second one, and the second one is what's being returned to the server. That goes back to the server and back to the client. Now, often with dynamic pages, it's going to a database to find information. So here's another version of this. So you have that PHP file. That gets sent to the PHP software, which takes it in and starts generating the file. However, it hits a point at which it wants to go find information from a database. So it goes to a database, which is a separate program, grabs the information, it returns it to the PHP program, prints it, finishes making the page, and then returns the whole thing in the web server software. The reason why this matters is thinking about backing up your website. If you've got a website on a shared server, it's important to have all of the files, which are the things you find on the hard drive. But it's also important to get the database as well, because typically all of the content, or in other words, the pages, the settings, are actually stored in database and not as files on the hard drive. To give you a comparison of why this matters, a static file website is very fast and very easy. The problem though is that you have to manually copy it with an FTP program and it's always the same for each user. So basically this is used for very simple set websites or to get images or style sheets or program code onto a server. The content management system like WordPress is much, much slower, but it's a lot easier to manage from an end user perspective. You can log into a website, change some things, and then update it. And typically this is done for almost all complex websites you find nowadays online. When it comes time to building a website, it helps to know some of the basic skill sets and languages you run into. The standard one is HTML. HTML is actually a very simple language that takes just no more than a couple of days to learn. But it's the framework that lets all the other pieces fit together. CSS is a different language which is done to create different style sheets. These are basically rules that get applied to your HTML to make them look a certain way. For example, to make something bold, give some margin to something, or change a font. The CSS itself is not very complex. You can learn it in probably a week or so. However, using it well is very tricky because you have to have some design skill sets. In other words, you have the person that doodled in an art notebook or has some idea of color scheming and how those different colors fit together well. So it's, tr it's easy to learn but difficult to do well. You also have code that actually runs either on the client or on the server. The standard language here is called JavaScript. JavaScript is a language that's very, very common online and is responsible for almost all dynamic behavior that happens inside of your browser. Writing this generally takes longer to learn than CSS and much longer in order to do well. This is the kind of a person that has a skill set of a professional programmer as opposed to a graphic designer. We also have languages that run as well called Java and Flash. These are not quite as popular in terms of running the whole website, but they are used frequently in order to have certain little bits of functionality. For example, you use Flash to show videos, you do YouTube interfaces, uh, anything that's very, very dynamic and moves around a lot is sometimes done in Flash. Java is a bit more heavyweight of an approach, but it's also found in a lot of sort of large company platforms. We also have code that runs on the server. 
So I gave the example of PHP earlier, but there's other ones too called Python, C Sharp, Perl, and a whole host of other languages. We also have the software called the web server, which is usually a program like IIS, Apache, or Nginx. The tricky thing about websites is that these are all different skill sets. The kind of person that tends to be really good at a web server may not be very good at designing CSS. So when it comes time to build a website, it's important to know the kind of skill set and the person that you're, you're hiring. You might be hiring more of a graphic designer if you're interested mainly in a very attractive looking website. You might hire someone who's a programmer if you want some custom functionality, such as interfacing with one of your custom backend programs. When it comes time to go online, one of the central ideas is how websites figure out who you are. Each request is actually separate on the internet. They're not really considered together. Instead, if you look at the request, they're tied together by a thing called a cookie. Now, this is not a cookie that you would eat. Instead, it's a small bit of information that you send with each request. So to give you an example, you might have a first request come in. You have that shown on the very top arrow, asking to get a page called index.html. The response that comes back from the server has these two lines in there in green called set cookie with the example of name equals value. The basic idea here is that they're telling the client to remember some sort of identity or ID value. And then in every future request, the client includes that cookie value with, with the request. There's some terminology that's effective as well. One of the examples is what's called bandwidth versus latency. Bandwidth is the idea of how much information can be transferred at one time. Latency is the speed which with it is translated. So for example, if you're gaming online, it's more important to have low latency than it is to have high bandwidth. But if you're downloading big files, you may not care if it gets there a second later than it should, as long as you have a lot delivered at any one time. Scalability is a similar idea in terms of measuring how quickly a server can deal with multiple requests. Basically, the idea is that a scalable system can quickly go up or go down to serve more clients or less clients. So for example, some things are very hard to scale, like a heart surgeon. You can't have one surgeon helping two people at the same time. However, things like music are much easier to scale by just having more people in the audience listening. There's also a concept called fault tolerance. The idea with fault tolerance is to say, if you lose one of the members, then does the whole thing still work or not? So example here, a barbershop quartet is very non-fault tolerant because if it loses one person, it has a significant impact on the overall performance. Compare that to a choir. A choir is very fault tolerant because it can lose any one member without having an overall degradation in service. When you set up a website, there's a number of resources you can use. For software, I recommend WordPress as being a very well-established standard you can also find images from places like Getty and iStockphoto, but you have to be careful with just grabbing anything you find online. If you use an image that belongs to somebody else, you are personally responsible for that misuse. For example, there's a companies out there that will actually search for their images that are being used without licensing and will actually send you a demand letter. When you come online, it's also good to use certain analytic tools. For example, Google Analytics, as well as Google Webmaster Tools. These are free tools Google offers that helps you figure out how your website's performing.